Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, Taylor polynomials, which are a way of taking some sort of continuous function and then replacing it with a polynomial approximation of it. Um, so this is Taylor polynomials. Uh, so these are things you uh, probably have already seen. It's like in your calculus class. Um, and uh, before we go too deeply into it, let me sort of give you some sense as to why it is uh, that we're going to uh, introduce polynomials uh, as an approximation of continuous functions. Uh, and the reason for this is because, uh, say you're trying to do something like um, approximate the integral or the derivative of a function. Um, we don't necessarily know how to do this in general, um, um, but we do know how to do this uh, quite systematically for the class of polynomial functions. Okay. So if you can take a continuous function and approximate it uh, with some sort of guaranteed error, if you will, um, by something else, uh, in particular a polynomial, uh, and then you want to uh, say approximate the integral or the derivative of this original function, what you can do is that you can take the polynomial approximation and then integrate and differentiate that, and then use that answer as an approximation of the original integration and differentiation problem. So that's just an example of this uh, sort of pervasive theme, if you will, uh, in many numerical methods which we're going to study this quarter, um, where you take a continuous problem, you approximate it in some way, and then the exact solution of that approximate problem um, is an approximation of the solution of the original problem. Okay? So uh, we'll see this uh, play out again and again as we um, go through the quarter. But uh, for now, let me just uh, focus on this question of how to take a function with the ability to compute derivatives of it and then replace it with uh, its Taylor approximation, and then as well as what kind of error you introduce when you do this. Okay. So the problem is as follows. Right. Um, say the only thing we know about a function let's say f of x right is uh, its function value at some point x0 as well as maybe its derivatives okay uh, say its first derivative and its second derivative okay can we use this information then to approximate the value of f of x in some neighborhood of this point where you happen to have this data, right? So can we uh, use this limited, uh, sorry, use this limited information to approximate? f of x near uh, x equals to x0. Okay, and, and so you probably know it's like uh, we can do this. So how do we go about doing this? So the idea is as follows, uh, right? So let's try to approximate f of x by a polynomial. Okay, so let's try to approximate f of x with a polynomial. Okay, uh, so let's uh, denote a polynomial degree n, <coughs> pn of x, in the following way. So b0 plus b1x plus b2x squared, all the way up to bn xn. Okay, so that's a polynomial of degree n. And um, we're going to basically require that this polynomial um, agrees with the data in some way. Okay, so you have data, you have f evaluated at x0, f prime evaluated at x0, and f double prime evaluated at x0. And you're going to try to approximate f of x by this polynomial pn of x. Okay, so what we can do is to just impose the condition that pn actually agrees with the data. Okay, what does that mean? So the conditions, if you will, which we want to satisfy are that pn at x0 is equal to f at x0, right? That's a natural thing. 
you want the first derivative of Pn at x0 to equal to f prime at x0, and you want Pn double prime at x0 to equal to f double prime at x0. Okay? So you have three conditions, okay, and it's easy to convince yourself uh, that uh, one way to just look at polynomials, um, which only have three unknowns, is to just pick the polynomial degree two, right? So, uh, so let's just consider um, sort of n equals to two, right? Because um, if you have a polynomial degree two, there are three coefficients, and you have these uh, three conditions here. So that's really the best you can do if you want to find a unique uh, polynomial which satisfies this condition. Okay, so the polynomial which satisfies the polynomial degree at most two, which satisfies these conditions, is uniquely defined, as we'll see in a little bit. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and see what happens. So I'm just going to let n equals to two. So that means I'm just going to look at polynomial degree two p two of x, which is b zero plus b one x plus b two squared, and I'm going to impose these conditions, right? So um, it's easy to convince yourself that you can rewrite a polynomial degree two um, using a different uh, set of bases, right? So I'm going to write this as c0 plus c1 x minus x0 plus c2 x minus x0 squared, okay? Um, and the point is that, you know, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between B's, the B's and the C's uh, so that um, these represent the same class of possible polynomials, okay? Um, the, the choice to look at it as a polynomial in X minus X zero as opposed to X is motivated uh, by the fact that you have your data at the point X zero, okay? So, so let's for now just look at polynomials of this form, C0 plus C1 x minus x0 uh, plus C2 x minus x0 squared, okay? And then we look at these conditions. So P2 at x0, see the advantage of doing it as a polynomial on x minus x0 is that when I substitute x equals x0 into this right-hand side, right, these terms, these higher order in x minus x0 terms vanish except for the leading term. So, so P2 of x0 is C0, but I'm calling that, uh, but that has to be equal to F at x0, so that's F at x0, okay? Then if I differentiate P2 respect to x to this, right, I get C1 plus 2C2 x minus x0, and then I can differentiate it one more time, P double prime at uh, P2 double prime x is equal to 2C2. All right, so, so now I can look at P2 prime at x0. That just gives me C1, that's C1. And C1 is equal to F prime of x0, all right? So I know what C0 is. C0 is F of x0, C1 is F prime at x0. And then I can do the same thing here. I look at P2. Uh, double prime at x0, that's just uh, 2c2, but that's also equal to f double prime at x0 uh, by my condition here. So this is uh, f double prime of x0. Okay, so with all that's said and done, what you end up with then is that p2 of x as the form f x0 plus f prime x0 x minus x0 plus um, f double prime, well, let me just put this as one half f double prime of at x0 x minus x0 squared, okay? So, uh, so that's probably familiar to you, that's the usual Taylor polynomial, uh, which you get. And then, um, sort of more generally, right, uh, if you have higher, if you happen to have higher derivatives, uh, then Pn of x is going to be 
um, sort of the cave derivative of f at the point x0 over k factorial uh, x minus x0 to the k power. And this is a sum from k equals to 0 to infinity. All right. So um, actually, that's not, not to infinity, to n, right? Because I'm just looking at pn. OK. So that's the degree n Taylor polynomial. All right, um, and you know it's like the way you derive this is sort of uh, equivalent to what we had done before. You uh, sort of postulate that you can write down a polynomial of degree n in the form uh, of a um, power series. It's like in uh, x minus x zero, right? And then you um, you impose the condition that that polynomial degree n uh, agrees with the uh, function values and the derivatives uh, at x0 which are provided to you. Uh, and when you do that, it's like uh, you'll see that uh, that gives you conditions on what the coefficients uh, c1 to cn are, and those are precisely just these k derivatives of f evaluated at x0 divided by k factorial. And the k factorial is coming from the fact that when you differentiate uh, you know, these polynomials, um, the appropriate number of times, it's like there will be a k factorial term uh, multiplied into the uh, ck coefficient. Okay? So basically, what will happen is that, you know, in general, you'll have this pn k x0 is equal to k factorial ck, which is the k derivative of f at x0, and then this gives you that ck is equal to k derivative of f at x0 divided by k factorial, which is exactly this coefficient here. Okay? All right. Anyway, so that's the, uh, the usual derivation of uh, the, Taylor, uh, sorry, the Taylor polynomial. So, uh, so the question is, uh, how good is this approximation? We already talked about how to generalize it. Okay? So, uh, so let's look at how good is our approximation. How good is the Taylor polynomial approximation? Okay. All right. Um, so let me state the theorem as follows. So the theorem is, is Taylor's theorem, or Taylor's remainder theorem. So suppose that uh, f is uh, cn plus 1. That means it's uh, n plus 1 differentiable, n plus 1 times continuously differentiable uh, in the interval from a to b. All right, so it's differentiable n plus 1 times. OK, and let. Uh, this pn of x be exactly this expression here. pn of x is equal to the sum from k equals to 0 to n of fk at x0 divided by k factorial uh, multiplying to x minus x0 to the k power. Okay, so what you want to do then is you want to characterize the error between pn of x. <coughs> Uh, and f of x, okay? Then the claim is that then there exists at least one point between x and x0 such that um, <coughs> f of x is equal to pn of x plus rn of x. 
okay, where Pn of x is your uh, degree nth degree Taylor polynomial, right? So this is the nth degree Taylor polynomial. And then that's the remainder term. Okay, and then the remainder looks like the following. So where Rn of x looks like, uh, well, Rn of x by definition is the sum of the sort of the remainder. So it's n plus one, fj equals n plus one to infinity. Well, let me call that k of uh, one over k factorial x minus x zero to the k power, uh, k derivative of f at x zero, right? That's sort of the terms which you have omitted from the infinite uh, Taylor approximation, okay? And then this turns out to be equal to um, f at some nth, or the nth plus first derivative of f at some unknown point uh, c, which in general depends on x divided by n plus one factorial multiplied into x minus x zero to the nth plus first power. Okay. All right. So um, this obviously looks like some sort of uh, mean value theorem type argument, right? Because um, you'll see that um, You know, there there exists. It's it's one of those things where, you know, given some function, it's like there exists some point. It's like um, where this kind of equality holds. All right. So it it has the flavor. It's like of this kind of mean value theorem type uh, statement, which we discussed before. And indeed, it's like what happens is that this remainder term actually has a precise integral representation. So, so, in fact. What happens is that Rn of x, right, it has the form uh, 1 over n factorial, the integral from x0 to x of uh, f, the n plus first derivative of f, okay, um, t um, x minus t to the nth power dx, okay? So, um, so if you have this expression and then you apply the uh, um, sort of the mean value theorem um, for integrals, it's like you end up getting an expression which looks like this, okay? All right, uh, so let me stop here. It's like, but one, one of the things I will do next is to show how you can derive, it's like the, uh, the Taylor remainder theorem uh, using um, sort of the fundamental term of calculus, it's like ended integration by parts and some induction. Okay, so let me just stop here for now.